everyone and welcome to Spring Creek Online. We are so excited that you have joined us today. Now, if this is your first time here at Spring Creek and you are new, we want to invite you to Starting Point, which starts August 6th and it'll be every first Sunday of every month. This is a great opportunity for you and your family to get to know some of the Spring Creek staff pastors and also get to learn what Spring Creek is all about. To register to starting points or any upcoming events, just go to our website at springcreekchurch.org slash events. Guys, thank you for joining us online. Enjoy the service. Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. So glad you're joining us today. We're continuing a brand new series we started just last week called Strapped. What we're doing is we're checking out really just all the challenges associated, especially what's been happening over the last couple of years. People have found themselves in a real financial pit with pinch with, with uh, astro inflation and just incredible markups by corporations. And it's been really challenging. It's left many of us strapped for cash. Well, last week we looked at the 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 beginnings of that, the the, the all the uh, the causes of that, what's really happening in society, and we looked at it in light of the serenity prayer that there are certain things that you and I just can't control. There are other things we can. We have to focus on what we can control, not on what we can't. Today, I want to talk to you about another aspect of feeling strapped, and that is debt, the thing that keeps us enslaved. As we get started, please bow your heads for just a moment and let's pray together. Father, I am grateful that we have this opportunity to just dig deeper into your word as we continue in these financially challenging times, looking at the whole subject of debt. Uh, debt is such a, a burden for so many. We carry debt. Uh, sometimes, God, it, there's worry, there's fear associated with that. Uh, many of us, God, feel like we had to get into debt for things that were beyond our control, and I certainly understand that, and you do too. So I pray, God, today as we analyze this from your perspective, from your word, that we be given hope, that we would find, God, that you've spoken to all of these issues clearly and with a path of compassion in your word. So God, guide us today as we look at your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the topic of slavery is something I want to talk to you about today because it has tremendous bearing on our understanding of finances and the parallels that the Bible makes between debt and the practice of slavery. So first, let me just begin with a short history lesson. Throughout history, slaves were acquired in one of seven different ways. Uh, one way was capture. For example, prisoners of war were often turned into slaves. A second way was purchase. Uh, the slave trade from Africa to the Americas when human beings were sold like merchandise from country to country is an example of that. Third is birth. Children who were born to parents who were enslaved also became slaves. Fourth is restitution. So if a thief were convicted in court and they had a judgment to repay what they'd stolen, but they didn't have the money to do it, the money was often obtained by selling that person into slavery. Fifth is debts. This is without a doubt the most common form of slavery in the world and has been around for as long as recorded history. Practically every co country on the face of the earth has been guilty of this at some point in their history. A sixth form of slavery was self-sale. This happened during times of hardship like drought or famine. Many people sold themselves into slavery rather than let their family starve. And seventh is abduction, people who are kidnapped and sold into slavery. This is still fairly common today, especially as it relates to children, prostitution, and the sex trade. Now, if you reflect for a moment on slavery as it's existed throughout history and ask yourself, what's the common denominator with all these various forms of slavery? It's this. Every one of them has an economic factor associated with it. It's either related to making money from the selling of people as property or a lack of money on the part of the individual who's then exploited for the value of their labor. A lot of people don't associate economics with slavery, but at its core, it's always been about the money. And since that's always been the case, I want to help you see the clear link between debt and slavery. Because there really is no debate on this. The most common form of slavery around the world today is debt-related. Now, this can be literal or metaphorical, but either way, it's real, 
and a reflection of the biblical truth that says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Uh, Publilius Syrus was a well-known Latin author. He was actually of Syrian descent and a former slave himself. Because he was so smart and talented, he won the favor of his master and eventually, who, uh, eventually freed him and then educated him. So Cyrus understood slavery from a first-person perspective. He once said this, debt is the slavery of the free. So as a former slave, he could recognize slavery even when it wasn't called that. So to one degree or another, every time you take out a loan or buy something on credit, you become a slave to that creditor. I mean, think about it. First, you become mentally enslaved to them. Having debts to pay has the power to keep you up at night, fill you with fear and worry as to whether or not you can make the payments or make them on time. Second, you become physically enslaved to them. A certain percentage of your day or days is now given to earning money to pay back that creditor. You are, in fact, working for them. You might even have to work longer hours just to be able to meet all your obligations. And then third, you become legally enslaved to them. Ultimately, in the eyes of the law, you're required to make your payments. And because you've entered into this contractual agreement with a creditor, failure to uphold your end of the bargain could result in penalties like loss of assets. And increasingly in Texas, even though it's against our state constitution, more and more people are being thrown into jail for default on debt. So what used to be a civil matter is now being twisted into a criminal matter. This is very wrong. To really understand the connection that God makes between debt and slavery, let's talk about debt slavery, the most common slavery in the world. So the first thing I tell you is this, if you can see it in its worst form, you can recognize it in its more subtle form. I mean, this is what Cyrus was saying. As a person who grew up enslaved, he knew what that experience was like. So he instantly saw the parallels between owing money and slavery. But let's look at it in its worst first. Debt bondage is the modern face of slavery. In the country of India, this type of slavery is epidemic. Desperately impoverished people will borrow small amounts of money from the wealthy, agreeing in turn to work off the debt. The loans are incredibly small by any standard. I mean, one child became a slave simply because the landlord had once given the child's father a blanket. We're talking a really insignificant amount of goods or money. But because of the way the debt repayment is structured, men, women, and children, sometimes even entire families, can spend a lifetime working to pay off the debt from something as insignificant as a blanket or a pair of shoes given to a family member. So understand, when you work as a slave in India, first you're paid only a tiny amount of money, usually around 17 cents a day. Then the lender charges excess interest rates that guarantee that that debt's never going to be paid off. Additional loans might even be granted for emergencies, but the recipients are constantly told that their debt is never paid. In many cases, especially in India, debts are even passed on to the next generation so that children are made to pay for something that was given to a parent. That's what happened to Shivana Putiaya. He was just 12 years old when he was sent into the fields to work as a farmhand to work off a debt inherited by his family. He worked from sunup to sundown every single day and was never given a day off. He was treated like an animal, fed only table scraps and given the same food that was used to feed the livestock. He was even made to sleep with the animals in the corral. Shivana never questioned his treatment because in Kamataka, the Indian state where he lived, slavery is a common experience for his social class known as the untouchables. But after 14 years of debt slavery, Shivana learned that this type of slavery had been outlawed in India for 30 years. Outsiders, in this case legal advocates, helped him to sue for his freedom. Shivana now works to educate other untouchables about the illegality of slavery and help them obtain their freedom. So whatever your thoughts were about slavery before today, keep this in mind. Slavery is an economic and social relationship between two or more people. A person is forced to work by someone else for little to no pay. The slave is exploited, dehumanized, and treated as a commodity. Slavery is all about the profits. The buyers and sellers exploit the labor of others in order to make more money. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but India is home to more slaves than all the other countries of the world combined. 
Debt bondage is the most frequent form of slavery in India, just like it is in the rest of the world. Now, don't think for a minute, though, that this stuff has never happened here. I read a lot of history. In particular, if you read much of the history of slavery in America, you begin to realize that the Emancipation Proclamation was not truly the end of slavery in America. It just morphed into another form. There's a PBS documentary entitled Slavery by Another Name. It's based on a book by the same name. In particular, it's all about what happened after the end of the Civil War. You see, at the close of the Civil War, most Americans assumed that the scar of slavery had been done away with for good. But in many ways, slavery was still around. It had just morphed into something else. Here's what happened. So the South had been devastated by the war. Fields, businesses, cotton gins were either completely destroyed or in shambles. The Southern plantation owners, who'd relied heavily on slavery to build their business empires, were now desperate. Faced with heavy losses in materials and lands and desperately needing to rebuild, they had no money to pay their former slaves to return to their fields to work for them. And as you can imagine, because of the way they were treated, many wouldn't even consider returning to those fields regardless of the pay. So several attempts were made to re-enslave the slaves. But the dominant way was through the passing of vagrancy laws in the South. Dallas has its own shameful history in regards to this that we don't even have the time to go into today. But I'll tell you this, what we refer to as Uptown today is the site of the old freedman's town where former slaves moved to try to escape the vagrancy laws enacted in the city of Dallas. It's also why Freedman's Memorial Park exists on the edge of Uptown. If you don't know that history, you need to know it. Now, if you don't know what vagrancy laws are, let me explain. Vagrancy laws demanded people prove that they had work in a day when proof was hard to come by. I mean, they didn't get check stubs back in those days. And when many people were just trying to make it on their own for the very first time in the new world. So you could be arrested off the street without evidence, charged with vagrancy, and then forced into the convict lease system. So here's the really evil part. Local jails would lease out convicts to corporations and plantations where they'd be made to work sometimes the same lands that they'd previously worked, but now under much harsher conditions. Because think about it. Under slavery, if you owned another human being, which we all know is immoral, but if you owned another human being, they were a capital investment. You wouldn't want to work them to the point they were of no use to you. That would be stupid. But if all you're doing is renting a human being from a local jail, who cares if they're overworked or underfed? If this one breaks, you just go back and rent another one. The treatment of the former slaves went from bad to worse under the convict lease system. By the way, in the South, arrests on vagrancy charges always went up significantly at two times of the year, planting and harvest seasons. So this was an economic cooperation between law enforcement and the former plantation owners. Bottom line, plantations were purchasing slave labor at a fraction of the cost of hiring workers for their fields. It was a system of exploitation. It was another form of slavery. Another way debt has been used to keep people in position of perpetual servitude was sharecropping. Now, this happened to blacks and poor whites all over the South. Brenda's father grew up on a sharecropping farm. That is, his father didn't own the land he farmed. Someone else did. Sharecropping is largely about economic exploitation. So you kind of have a rental agreement. The owner of the land would get a percentage of every harvest, which sounds fair and reasonable as long as that share is reasonable, right? But how fair and reasonable do you think these former masters were, especially in regards to their former slaves? In addition, a sharecropper also needed seeds and farming implements and supplies. They had no place else to turn to except the local landowner or a local merchant. So to purchase what they needed to farm, they were forced to use their future crop as collateral to finance loans. Of course, they were charged super high interest rates under a very unfair terms that virtually guaranteed that they could never break out of debt. Listen to these researchers talk about what sharecropping was really like. They said the farmers stayed in perpetual debt and slavery perpetuated itself. It was economic bondage, but it was still slavery. So once you begin to understand how debt has been used to enslave people throughout history, once you see it in its worst forms, you begin to recognize it in its more subtle forms. This is why we as a church took on the predatory lending industry right here in our own city. The payday lenders in Texas have been highly unregulated. 
charging fees and interest that are unheard of, and structuring debt to keep people locked in a state of permadebt in order to bleed them dry financially and seize whatever assets they've been offered or that they've offered as collateral. Now, I know that some of you, politically speaking, are pretty strongly aligned against regulation of any type. And I would say it's a legitimate conversation to talk about what things have become overregulated to the point that they become an albatross on business and the economy. But I could never go along with the idea that doing away with all regulation is a good idea, not because of some political point of view, but because of God's word. God is not an advocate for complete market deregulation. Instead, God regulates economics in the Bible. He regulates the maximum length of loans and the necessity of debt forgiveness. God regulates interest on loans, what is acceptable, what's not. God has something to say about collateral and how creditors are required to handle that collateral. God even speaks to the issue of default, plus a lot, lot more. Do you know why laws exist biblically? Laws place a limit on human depravity. Laws don't have the power to transform society or change the human heart. That's not why laws exist. God regulates commerce because if not, human depravity will use economics to feed their own greed and exploit and enslave their fellow human beings. Bottom line, in God's way of looking at economics, economic relationships are never allowed to make life hopeless. You see, the Bible makes this bold declaration in its approach to money and wealth, and it's this. People are more important than money, period, full stop. This is crystal clear in God's word from cover to cover. The idea that debt could not be held over a person's head for all perpetuity is something enshrined in Old Testament law and something that was the subject of Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth. After six years of debts, in the seventh year, a debt had to be forgiven regardless of the balance. In fact, in my book, I devote an entire chapter to explaining the gospel as an expression of jubilee. The jubilee is something described in the Old Testament that Jesus says he came to fulfill in Luke chapter 4. So like I said, every seventh year, all debts had to be canceled, wiped out. You could not keep on collecting money owed to you after six years. But then in the 50th year, which is what Jubilee means, means 50, that is seven Sabbaths of years. Seven times seven is 49. So the next year, the 50th year is Jubilee. In Jubilee, not only were your debts forgiven, but if you'd become a slave because of default on a debt, you were set free. But here's the best part. The assets you once had, in particular your land, had to be returned to you. So if Jubilee happened only once every 50 years, that means that once in a lifetime, you'd get a major do-over. Wouldn't that be nice? A chance to begin again, an economic restart, an opportunity for a new life. Why? Because people are more important than money. Economic relationships are never to be allowed to make life hopeless. So let me shift gears for a moment, and let's talk about unavoidable versus irresponsible debt. Let me just say right up front, debt isn't necessarily a terrible, shameful thing we should avoid at all costs. For one thing, the Lord's Prayer implies that everyone stands on both sides of the lending relationships. It says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, we all owe someone and we're all owed something. Debts are part of life. Now, some Christians erroneously believe that God forbids all debt. There's even a popular Christian finance guru who teaches this very thing and perverts what the Bible actually says. They base that teaching on Romans 13, 8, which says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. But literally what this verse says is let no debt remain outstanding. Paul is not saying you can never owe money. He's just reminding us to be faithful to pay the debts we owe. Besides that, I, besides that idea that you're never to borrow money makes no sense in light of how much God works, God's Word talks about lending money and how to do it right. This verse is encouraging people to be people of the Word and people of our Word, that when we enter into an agreement with a creditor, to be faithful to meet that obligation. It's not saying you can't owe money. You know, I financed my home through Rodney Anderson over in North Dallas. The guy's in the top 1% of mortgage brokers in the U.S. He does a major portion of the mortgage business right here in DFW. So he sees lots of clients. 
when I went into to his office to finance my home, Rodney and I were talking when his assistant emerged from a back room and said, Mr. Stewart, I'd like to shake your hand. And I said, okay, but why? And he said, well, you're the first minister I've ever met with outstanding credit. Now, when you consider the volume of business Mr. Anderson does, I thought, that's terrible. I wish his experience had been the complete opposite. I, I would much rather have heard him say, Mr. Stewart, why is it every minister I meet has outstanding credit? But I told this guy, you know, it's really sad to me that of all people, ministers are the ones with the worst credit. And then, you know me, I, I had to give him a little history lesson. So I told him, I said, you know, the word credit comes from the word credo, which means I believe. So every time someone pulls my credit report, they're checking on my store of believability. That is, they want to know how well I've kept my promises to those to whom I owe money. To me, paying what I owe is a matter of integrity. I want my promises and my behavior to always align with one another. I mean, that's what Paul's saying in Romans 13, 8, be faithful to pay what you owe, not that you can't owe money to anyone. That's nonsense. So let's talk about two types of debt. The first sort is unavoidable debt. There are times where you legitimately need to borrow money. Things like accident, illness, job loss, other emergencies. I'm talking about situations beyond your control, like what we talked about last week, when you simply have to have help. You seek a loan because there's no other way to survive. But when you're desperate, there are those who see that as an opportunity to make a quick buck and take advantage of your desperation. There's a powerful passage in the book of Nehemiah chapter 5 that's about this very thing and what God thinks about it. We're never to take advantage of someone else's misfortune. Making the desperate destitute arouses the anger of God. So friends, life happens. And if you're one of those Christians who say all debt is wrong, you just haven't read your Bible very well at all. Someday you may legitimately need to seek a loan. And when you do, you need the help and understanding of God's people, not a judgmental attitude. But I'm also certainly not saying that all debt falls into the category of unavoidable debt. There is such a thing as irresponsible debt. I like the way Dr. Tony Evans said it. Financially speaking, there are three kinds of people, the haves, the have-nots, and those who've not paid for what they have. America is a debtor society, and where most of us get into trouble is with something called consumer debt. Of course, the worst type of consumer debt is credit card debt. So let's take a minute and look at how we're doing as a nation with credit card debt. One thing that's very clear when it comes to credit card debt spending is we lie. We lie about our true financial behavior, and we especially lie about credit card debt. Listen to this. Bankrate conducted a financial literacy survey, and here's what they found. 58% of respondents claim to pay off their credit cards in full every month, a marked contrast to studies that show that that number is closer to 40%. So here's my question. Why lie? Why lie about your financial reality? I'll tell you why we lie. We lie because we're ashamed. We're embarrassed. We don't like to admit that there's an area of our lives that's out of control. Yet it's causing so many other problems. It disrupts our peace of mind. Secrets in our closest relationship eventually turn toxic or leak out in other ways. Listen to this. One third of Americans with credit card debt say no one else knows how much they owe, according to a new report. So this was just a month ago in the hill on the hill you know the the publication uh for congress or how about this more than two in five americans said they've withheld financial information or lied about it to a significant other so they've kept secrets about how pricey some of the things they bought actually were they lie about their income level or their credit scores they lie about the amount of credit card debt they actually have and the younger you are the more likely it is you've lied to your partner about money 63% of Gen Z, so those are people in their early 20s, and 58% of millennials, so these are late 20s to early 30s, said they lied to or withheld financial details from their significant other. So let's be honest. Lying about financial behavior is a sure sign that we feel shame and fear in regards to its disclosure. This is why we have to talk about this. We have to break the power of secrecy, get it all out into the light. In the light, things can be addressed, they can be healed. In the light, secrets lose their power over us. But hidden away in the darkness, those things we hide have absolute power over us. And again, if you think I'm just talking about poor people, I'm not. 
According to Lending Club, more than half of Americans earning between $100,000 and $150,000 a year live paycheck to paycheck. Or how about this? And this was just released earlier this month. Most Americans have missed, missed at least one credit card payment. So could this be you that I'm talking about? Based on the numbers I've cited, probably at least half of the people listening to me right now, this affects. You make good money, but maybe you're spending beyond your means. You're missing payments. You're living paycheck to paycheck. You're keeping secrets from the one person you shouldn't be keeping secrets from. So what do you do? In our time remaining, let me talk to you about breaking the chains of debt. First thing, stop the bleeding. You know, when I was in Boy Scouts and I was working on my first aid merit badge, we all had to go downtown to the YMCA to take a first aid course. And I'll never forget, they asked us, if you came upon someone who was bleeding badly and wasn't breathing, which should you take care of first? And they said, the bleeding. Because whereas the body can go without oxygen for four minutes, a person can bleed to death in less than one. When you're bleeding financially, that becomes the priority as well. You know, Will Rogers once said, if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. Basically, you have to make a decision to be done with that. You say, today, I declare war on indebtedness. I'm sick of it. I've had it. I'm turning away. I'm not going to rob the future to pay for my past. From now on, I'm going to operate on a pay-as-you-go basis. In other words, if the cash is not in my wallet or in my checking account, I'm not going to spend it. Now, one of the biggest downsides in dealing with debt is the longer you live with it, the more you accommodate it. This is true of practically any other problem in your life. The longer you live with a problem, the more you accommodate the problem. Uh, let me tell you something about slavery, whether it's literal or metaphorical, whether you're talking about alcohol, alcohol pornography, drugs, or even debt. One of the biggest problems is a thing called learned helplessness. So back in the late 60s, early 70s, a series of psychological experiments under the direction of Dr. Martin Seligman showed the effects of sub subjects being administered repeated, inescapable electrical shocks. After extensive conditioning, the subjects, which were usually dogs, ceased to search for relief or release, even when they were presented a means of escape. The researchers said this is what happens to people, too. When confronted by what appears to be an inescapable problem, we just give up. We get locked into a state of helplessness. It happens with addicts, it happens in bad marriages, and it happens in finances all the time. Certainly, there are uh, numerous factors that contribute to problems with debt. Sometimes, legitimately, there are things beyond our control, an illness, an accident, a loss of a job, a recent divorce. But if we give up, if we take on a victim's mentality, then the debt spiral becomes irreversible. The beginning point is always honesty, to get honest with yourself, to get honest with God, get honest with someone else who can help you. Second thing you do, stay the course. To deal with that, you have to work hard, keep a steady income, make progress little by little. The Bible reminds us this is the path of victory. Look at this in Proverbs. He who gathers money little by little makes it grow. Or how about this from Galatians? Let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So getting out of debt is not easy. It, it takes patience, perseverance, a willingness to sacrifice. But with God's help, you can do it, but you can't give up. Ron Blue, he's a really well-known Christian finance guru. He reminds us getting into debt is as easy as going down an ice-covered mountain. Getting out of debt is just as difficult as climbing that same mountain. Will Azell said something similar. He said, getting into debt is like riding a bicycle downhill. It's exhilarating at first. <laughs> Life in the charge lane is a lot of fun, but you'll always have to go back home uphill. So all of us have to make tough choices and then stick to them. It will require sacrifice because change is never easy. The Bible reminds us of this, of this reality too. It says, no discipline is pleasant at the time, but painful. Later, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who were trained by it. So no discipline is going to be pleasant, just like the Bible says. It's painful, but we do it for the payoff. God said the result is righteousness, which is right ways of living, living the way you were meant to live, and peace, freedom from worry, true flourishing in your life. 
Remember this, if you're a believer, God has already taken care of your worst and biggest debt you ever had. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid your sin debt. These last words on the cross were tetelestai, paid in full. Money issues are a piece of cake compared to that. So God is for you. He really is. There are more provisions and protections for debtors in the Bible than there are for creditors. Constantly throughout scripture, you're told that you're worth more than what you owe. And that leads to this final principle, stand on his promises. For many people, it's not their faith that determines their financial behavior. It's their fear. And when fear takes over, it suffocates faith. Jesus understands this. He knows that many of us fear not having enough. We're afraid of losing what we have to survive. We worry more about finances than practically any other thing. It's been said that the average American spends half of their waking hours thinking about money and their financial needs. If you haven't learned to trust God with this part of your life, then a major portion of your life, maybe as large as half, is virtually untouched by God. Worry is a warning light. Worry means I'm doubting God's love for me. I'm doubting God's promises. I don't believe what he said when he said he'll take care of me. Listen to this. Don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God. Popular mainstream author and financial advisor Susie Orman said this in her book, The Nine Steps to Financial Freedom. She said, from years as a financial planner, I have learned that true financial freedom doesn't depend on how much money you have. Financial freedom is when you have power over your fears and anxieties instead of the other way around. Susie Orman understands what most financial planners are oblivious to. Most of the stuff you're going to hear or read today about money is going to be about how to get it, manage it, or invest it. But there's very little written that talks about anything deeper than that. And believe me, my friends, there's so much more to money than simply how to make it, manage, or invest it. People are beginning to wake up to the reality that beneath the surface of our lives, there are often lifelong fears which drive our financial behavior. We actually have an emotional relationship with money, wounds, scars, baggage we carry surrounding money that often keeps us trapped in poor financial behavior. Professor Russell Belk, he's a finance professor at the University of Utah, he said studies confirm our relationship with money is not practical, but emotional. By the way, this is why money classes are often sometimes only moderately beneficial. Oh, I mean, sure, they're great in addressing the nuts and bolts of finances. They're strong on technique and advocate good financial practice. But rarely, if ever, do they address these underlying wounds that people have. What I'm saying is the problem for the average American is not just ignorance of good financial practice, but it's fear that sits in the driver's seat of their life that's led to so much poor financial decision-making. If, if no one ever addresses the fear, then all the good advice in the world is going to fall on deaf ears. I mean, this is one of the reasons I love the Bible so much. When it comes to money and financial principles, it has all kinds of good stuff to say. But the major emphasis of Scripture, unlike most financial classes, addresses our fears around money, not primarily earning, saving, and investing, but fear, because God knows that you and I will never do finances His way unless and until we trust in Him more than we do our own wounding. This is why God makes the promises He does. Listen to this from Matthew 6. Don't worry and ask yourself, will we have anything to eat? Will we have anything to drink? Will we have any clothes to wear? Only people who don't know God are always worrying about such things. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all of these. But more than anything else, put God's work first and do what He wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. So Jesus is making very clear that when I worry, I'm acting like a non-believer. I'm acting like God doesn't even exist. Now, I want you to consider the audience that Jesus was speaking these words to you to. Do you think that living conditions for them were easier or more difficult than our day? They were more difficult. Most of them were incredibly poor. They lived on less than a dollar a day. They would be poor until they died. 95% of them would never be able to read or write. Many of them were lame or sick. They had no medicines. Plagues would come and kill up to a third of an entire city. Many of them were slaves. They would never be free. They owned no land. A child born into the first century world would likely not live past the age of 30. That was their world. 
Now, if you look around, you know, yourself and among your friends, there's a lot of people you know over 30. But back in Jesus' day, 30 was about the average life expectancy. So would you say they had more or less to worry about than us? So now it's 2,000 years later. Living conditions have gotten a lot better. We're better educated, healthier, better resourced, cleaner, and freer, hundreds of times over what people had back then. So isn't it great that we don't have to worry anymore? That anxiety and worry has just been eliminated from the human condition? No, we worry, don't we? Worry and anxiety have gone through the roof. There was a study done recently by Harvard University about how over the last 40 years, the diagnosis of depression and anxiety is 10 times more common than what it was just 40 years ago. Even though by every objective measure, living conditions, healthier, better educated, wealthier, and so on, anxiety is higher among Gen Z and millennials than any prior generation ever recorded. And this is Jesus' point. You will never get worry-free by engineering improved circumstances, by having more wealth, better health. The only way is learning how to put your life in the hands of the Father to let it go. Jesus told us how. He said, put God's work first and do what he wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. I mean, this is a truth that I take to heart through through all kinds of financial hardships, through all kinds of setbacks, through all kinds of things that I couldn't see coming. Even if, you know, I I had a crystal ball, I just couldn't see them coming to me at all. But they came. And I've learned that when I put God first, then what he said, put me first, seek my kingdom first, all these other things will be taken care of. I make God my priority in my finances. And that's one of the promises I cling to because it's the only thing that is sufficient to eradicate the fear and the worry that exists in the human heart. My prayer for you today is regardless of whether you find yourself in a financial mess of your own making or not of your own making, that you would learn that there is a path forward, that you can stop the bleeding, that you can stick with it. You can stick with a plan and work that plan. But most of all, you can stand on the promises that God makes to us, that we're his kids, he doesn't abandon us, that we will have what we need when we need it. Would you pray with me? Father, I just wanna thank you today that as we look at the topic of debt and we see this clear relationship between owing money and this sense of slavery that can overtake our life, that God, what you articulated more than 2,000 years ago is still true today. I pray, God, that you would give us the courage to face our financial reality. If there's some among us who find ourselves being dishonest with the person that we care about most in this life, that today might, might be a day where we break out of the lies, we come out of the darkness, that we share what's really going in our life, so that we can begin to build a future based on the reality of where we actually are. God, help us to be honest. Help us to break the power of shame. Help us, God, to know that, yes, it may require a sacrifice. Yes, it will require a plan. But working a plan, we can slowly and steadily get out of debt. And then most of all, God, that we will claim your promises, that you said that you will take care of our needs if we put you first. So in every way, in our family, God, may you be number one. In our business, may you be number one. In our finances, may you be number one. In my personal walk, may you be number one. I want to seek you first so that I can claim your promises in all things. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for being with us. Join us again next week as we continue in this series. We're so glad that you make Spring Creek a part of your everyday week. Remember, you can always share these messages with friends. A lot of people are going through this. And as we saw today, a lot of people are not being honest about their true financial struggles. Maybe hearing it from somebody else, maybe hearing it in a message like this will help them to face that reality, come clean about that reality, and move into the light where those financial matters can be healed. Share it with a friend. You might just make a huge life-changing difference. God bless. Have a great week. Thank you.